Hello, this is Michael Reese. Welcome to Ad Hoc, a virtual talk series. I'm a sculptor and new media knot. I'm here to have fun and sharp conversations with some of the smartest people in art, technology, and sculpture. My interests and those of our guests will range far and wide and focus on making and the artist's role in our current era. We'll be talking to artists, curators, designers, and more. Welcome to Ad Hoc. Hi, I'm Anna Arison, Editor-in-Chief for Battery Journal. I am here in conversation with artist, educator, innovator Michael Reese and Gary Schneider, the Executive Director for the Grounds for Sculpture. And we are here today to discuss the current exhibition on view uh, at the Grounds for Sculpture, Synthetic Cells, Sight and Parasite. Um, it is up through January 10th. 2021 by appointment only. Um, and there is a beautiful companion catalog, this incredible text that I've been mining and reading, um, which is available also uh, surrounding this exhibition and published um, for the event of, of the exhibition. Um, I, I'd like to thank the International Sculpture Center for hosting this talk, and I would also like to thank the Grounds for Sculpture very much. Thank you, and welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Good news. So I was thinking I would just start by reading a quote by you, Gary, um, and this is in the, the catalog. These sculptures are at once light and heavy, the skin or membrane marking a threshold between the tangible and perceptible, while the vortex inside the external augments create networked microcosms and macrocosms within the space. This new body of work explores layers of augmented form. It remains decidedly sculptural, inhabiting a distinctive space between the physical and digital. This exhibition comes at a time when these distinctions between what is real and virtual between our bodies and our technological tools are converging in ways that are profoundly reshaping our lived experience. So um, I'm wondering if, if you could both talk a little bit about the physical uh, aspects of the work, the, the, the formal aspects, and then we could move into, um, it's this multivalent installation where there are these layers and layers of meaning and technology um, and if we could just unpack that a little bit for the viewers and if you could both uh, just kind of talk about physical formal and conceptual aspects and Gary you're in the physical space there so we can see the sculpture behind you which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah and I, I think one of the things that, that is about being in the space here too, is uh, the the way in which the the sculptures are, are floating. Um, you know, they kind of hover, and I think that that kind of also creates this liminal kind of space and experience uh, that is like that threshold. Uh, it kind of creates a very visceral kind of uh, of experience of that membrane, as I was saying, between the the the, the, the physical and the virtual, the the um, you know the object and the con you know the conceptual. Um, and I, I think Michael's, you know, notion of, of uh, suspending these um, amplifies the, the air inside of them. It both, give, both gives it a, a real sort of solid form. Um, I have one that's sort of hovering up above my head here. Uh, so you really kind of get the sense of their, of their scale, but it also gives this kind of like matrix kind of like void that you are floating within. So these kind of a Petri dish of, of uh, these forms. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, a lot of times people don't like to discuss. I, I, I have always been a site oriented sculptor. I always, whenever I'm doing an exhibition, even if it's an exhibition of work that I've already accomplished, when I come to the site, I take on the site really seriously and uh, think about the history and think about what it is. And, and so, this space was complicated in many ways. There was, it was the intersection of a lot of different things. 
not the least of which was the uh, you know fairgrounds, the fact that it was an old fairgrounds, which I think is a wonderful detail. But you know, it used to be a race car track around there somewhere, and it used to be you know carnivals would go on, and all you know it was a place of joy, and a and a starting point of joy. And then at the same time, I think this building was built by Seward, right? Isn't that the case? Wasn't that all new, newly developed? It's all new and developed. So, yeah. yeah. So, so the point is, is that then it take, took on a new character, a new way, and you know, it also had certain requirements that I had to engage. And so, in some ways, that's a little bit more like the way an architect would work with a situation, mm -hmm. or the way a designer would work with a situation. There were some givens that I couldn't go past. I had to incorporate them in the work. And I found that to be, uh, you know, very challenging in the beginning. And then when we, you know, when I lit upon this idea of being able to put them up into the air, you know, Gary, as you say, a lot of ideas start to come from those solutions, you know? Mm -hmm. And it starts to emphasize the sort of internal structure or the internal logic of a show. And that's, uh, I always find that to be a thrilling and kind of exciting thing. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Without putting too fine a point on it, I want to say that uh, one something that's really unusual about this show is the work didn't exist before we made it. Mm -hmm. And Grants for Sculpture made an unbelievable commitment to work with me to develop this work over three years, right? And not knowing, <laughs> you know, trusting, but not knowing whether I would pull it off, whether it would be any good. And I love that feature too, because uh, it's like a real conversation like we're having now. Something inventive can happen. It could go south, but it also is, there's something live, something amazing about it. Well, in, in very much like scientific discoveries in which, in which the unexpected may come out of of that that intensive um, process, right? The um, the it's really fascinating to look back through the iterations of the design for this, and yeah. where they maybe started out more um, as like real kind of like scientific kind of containment yeah. units, right? And that element's still here. There's still a little bit of the you know decontamination you know kind of unit, but they've grown to be so much more than yeah. than, than you know than where they first begin. And I think it's through that process, it, it kind of develops. You know, I have a picture, I can share it briefly of those early proposals. So let me do that. And you guys are seeing my, um, yeah, here it is. Mm -hmm. So while you're queuing that up, um, Gary, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the history with the Ground for, Grounds for Sculptures uh, mm -hmm. working with new media and new technology and digital technology uh, to facilitate projects um, and to work with artists and to expand the language of, of form and sculpture um, and, and media, new media and digital technologies. Could you talk a little bit about that history? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm getting distracted by Michael's. Uh, <laughs> some of these are, are fascinating. They're beautiful. You see again, they're... Michael, the, these like kind of organ-like forms. Yeah. Uh, you know, there there are always these um, paths not taken when when you have the yeah the, both the conception and then the the practicality of actually like going through with fabricating a uh, an exhibition. So I, I think you have a lifetime of other ideas to mine here, Michael. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Actually, I'm very excited. Yeah. And then to your, to your question, so Grounds for Sculpture, we're located about halfway between New York and Philadelphia and um, 42 acre uh, garden with about 300 sculptures out, outside. And these very, very kind of um, elaborate, imaginatively designed kind of spaces. As, as Michael indicated, it was the former New Jersey State Fairgrounds. And, um, but in the 1970s and 80s, the um, Seward Johnson Atelier had moved to this area and uh, we kind of grew out of, uh, of their fabrication facilities. It was an active foundry, uh, stone carving, metal fabrication, very traditional sculpture materials. But even very early on in, in as early as the early 1980s, they were embracing um, technology to really kind of advance those traditional sculpture processes. Um, and then including having one of the earliest digital uh, departments where they were doing 3D scanning, um, CNC milling, 
And so that's been a real part of the history. Uh, while that's a separate entity, we, we work closely with them. And it's one of the assets that we have uh, in addition to the outdoor and these incredible indoor spaces that we offer artists. So when artists are coming to do a project at Grounds for Sculpture, we've got this incredible um, uh, kind of uh, resource of, of, of craftsmen, of technology, of tools. Um, but, you know, I think Michael's exhibition really kind of pushes the, the envelope for us uh, a little bit further. Um, you know, I think the, the use of technology as a tool, um, you know, to enable the construction or creation of a sculpture, I think has a long history here. And I think, Michael, what you're bringing to, to, to the, the evolving definition of what sculpture means, you know, for us, and I think for the field, um, is, is pushing that a little bit further in, in uh, also questioning, asserting and questioning materiality. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's interesting, we have a, a concurrent mm -hmm. show right now of uh, the sculptor Bruce Beasley, who uh, recently turned 80 and has been partnering with Google and is using the Oculus goggles to sculpt in physical space. And so it's a really great companion uh, to Michael's show. And, and, and Bruce, you know, at, at 80 adopting this, uh, you know, sculpting in virtual reality, it allows him to create sculptures that he says he never would have been able to create without this technology because he's freed of um, physics and gravity and all the enemies of sculptors and um, but the the output though for him is the physical object um, and I think like as I said in Michael's case um, it is this um, in-between space. Ah yes yes um, just to address that if I may uh, there's a really great quote in the catalog by Michael Reese about the physical uh, and the metaphysical and the digital uh, aspect of it. It's in synthetic, in, in synthetic cells, site and parasite, uh, they are a speculative investigation that is part science fiction, part architecture and part pastoral. They are abstract and extended almost to immateriality and composed of images, virtual objects, animations, and an interactive app accessed by digital tablets. While large in scale, they are mostly air. Um, and then you go on, Michael, to talk about kind of three kind of states and um, these states reverberate among the other states and create an interesting sort of multi-layered, complex, rich, uh, immersive experience right. uh, for, for, the, for the viewer. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, the, um, you know, that I, on some level, I mean, I didn't invent the technology, okay? I didn't invent CAD or working with CAD, and I also didn't invent augmented reality or anything like that. But what I feel like in some ways that I've done is I've established a platform using these technologies uh, to explore and extend what sculpture is. And, you know, what I wanted to do in, by, in the essay was to establish the three structures. So on one level, you have a physical structure. That's the air, the pneumatic. It has all kinds of qualities of physics and, and its material existence, you know? Um, and some of those are quite mysterious and fun. You know, Gary, I'm sure you've noticed when you've walked in, uh, sometimes it's deflated, sometimes it's a little more inflated, the heat, uh, makes it puffier, the cold makes it shrink a little bit. They're kind of got a, you know, vibrant, they're not fixed in space the way a marble sculpture would be or where, the way a, that's the immaterial, you know. But at the same time, there are very physical structures. And for example, that internal external conversation, which is a classic sculptural trope, is happening here only because the internal pressure is playing off to the, there's two chambers and the two chambers are playing off each other to create the form. And one cannot exist without the other. That's a very unusual internal, external conversation, you know, for example, all right. So then the next step of course is the photographs and the photo, pho photography has its own language. It has its own presence. Uh, you know, some of them are not, some of them are actually technically photographs of drawings not photographs of some subject or something or other. Mm -hmm. So I'm playing with the slippage of what an image is and how images work and, and all of the sort of the, you know, when I say metaphysical, I really mean the value 
I'm, I really am referring to values. Uh, there's the material presence and then there are the values that are inher inherent or enhanced. Um, and then finally, the interactive component, which is the, uh, which is a whole other thing. Now, I, you know, that's the computer, that's the data thing. That's the, so we have different states and they all both subvert each other and combine with each other to create this thing. So I think the viewer is in some ways, um, I kind of want to say the viewer, it's not easy for the viewer to figure out where they are mm -hmm. and what they're looking at. And that's very purposeful on my part. I want the viewer to have a kind of a, a, an experience of, we might call it the strange or of the other, of not being quite located. Now I'm sure that in some time period when kids have grown up on augmented reality, that displacement will no longer be evident. But in our contemporary moment, that displacement is really important. So, uh, Gary, do you want to address? Uh, I, I, yeah, I just, you have okay. this position of being there and you can watch people explore and experience this installation. So that's kind of a, a privileged uh, and interesting place to be. Can you speak to that idea of maybe the viewer being sort of dislocated or finding their, their path, finding their way? Yeah, I mean, I think the immersive quality and the way in which the Michael has designed the the and, and made the AR component very accessible. The um, uh, these kind of rolling carts, so I can I can grab one in, in a moment. Um, but it, it's really kind of broken down any barriers to to people participating. And you know, it's interesting when we began working uh, with with Michael. You know, we were questioning whether the bulk of our audience would be kind of uh, understand this language. You know, and uh, so much in those three years has evolved so quickly where there's a much more kind of uh, sort of uh, fluid uh, sort of understanding of the of the language of, of augmented reality and um, how it's you know been so pervasive in our, our it's you know in our lives and uh, so it's been really interesting to see young and old you know kind of you know getting right in there and, and kind of understanding um, the that kind of interface that uh, that immersion um, I'm interested in in the, the the notion of of the kind of complicating the the subversion, Michael, because that's I think that's something that's happening on so many levels yeah. in, in in the work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, on one level, I could be you know accused of being just as guilty as a person like Zuckerberg, you know, uh, which I don't think that's what I'm about. I'm not I'm not trying to uh, destabilize the the situation for 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 to create a more power for myself or something like that. But what I'm interested in on many levels, I keep going, I, I use this word metaphysical and of course it's a huge word. It has an enormous philosophical history of its usage. It's got all kinds of problems. I investigated a little bit through this work with some notion of speculative objects or object oriented ontology, speculative realism and which I have found very useful and very, uh, you know, I love the, I love to engage in that. And I think that what I've done is gone full, all right, so I think it should, it's important to say first that the focus of this work was joy. That I really, really wanted people to come in and experience joy. And, and, and to make that a, a an organizational principle or a, a part, not only of the show, but of people's interaction with it, right? Now, that's a little bit different than this displacement that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But the displacement has kind of got this wonderful quality of if you engage the joy, if you engage the pleasure of the show, that um, you can kind of find yourself in a, an almost a carnival or, you know, Ferris wheel or you know, that kind of environment and you become interact, it, there's the interactivity of the app, but then there's also sort of a mental interactivity that goes on where you start to create those meanings for yourself. And the, the experiences, to, you know, you might have this moment of displacement, 
But in my mind, that displacement takes you to, to, uh, to the opportunity of being a creator in the environment. And, you know, that happened literally because kids would pose other kids and take screenshots, right? So that happened literally that way. But it also happened figuratively as well. People project, begin to project themselves into the space in a newer, or, and I'll just say a slightly different way than you would technically do it with sculpture, you know? And that was fascinating to me. And, and I, love the, I love the house of mirrors quality of bouncing around between the physical space, the photo space, and the interactive space, you know? So, and I don't know if you can respond to that, Gary, but I, I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, this was three years in the making. So this was, this is a really big project and undertaking. Um, and there must be real passion to, to sort of go, go the distance, you know, and, and get everything together. It's a huge project, right? It's a huge project. Um, so what was the inspiration? I mean, that's a, that's a really important question. What inspired you and, and sort of allowed you to go, go the distance and certainly with your help, Gary, and, and the Gramsci sculpture. To Wait, make you, it possible. Is that a question for me? Or is that a question for Gary? For you, but for both of you. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a huge undertaking. I think that's a great question for Gary because, uh, you know, it's extraordinary that a place such as Grounds for Sculpture or a museum kind of environment would take on something so speculative. And so, you know, you guys must have really, I mean, you mentioned a little bit the conversations you had about yeah. whether digital media, and this and that, but I imagine there were many more, you know, yeah. about how appropriate it was to do this. And I'd love to hear you talk about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think my role is as an enabler and I, I think it's important to acknowledge the, the curator for the project, Tom Moran, who, who you know, I think has a, a particular uh, gift, I think of working with artists and helping, helping artists kind of go from a concept and an idea and, and through all the you know, kind of iterations uh, and really supporting. And, you know, so uh, I got to, you know, enable and support Tom Moran and, and, and Michael uh, on this journey as, as they kind of thought through all the logistics of how do you create these inflatable forms and, uh, you know, finding out that the folks that do it for the Macy's Day Parade might not be able to, to, to uh, meet Michael's complexity of design and, and all the way to finding, you know, fabricators in, you know, in Canada and then ultimately in China yeah. that um, that were uh, that, that actually specialize in creating bouncy houses for children. And yeah. you go back to that joy that you um, there's there's something integral in the, the way in which these are, are made that I think creates that familiarity for people. But, um, you know, that Michael and, and Tom going and prototyping in China with a fabricator um, is, you know, we're, we're excited as an institution to be able to uh, support artists, you know, taking ambitious steps. You know, it's, it's why I do this work is, um, you know, is to be able to see uh, what artists come up with when you're given uh, that trust and, and resources and, and the kind of teamwork or camaraderie that comes from, that's required of, of sculpture. You know, it's required in printmaking and a few other uh, art forms that are more um, communal um, but it, but it's definitely uh, within the sculpture environment. Yeah, and I, you know, it, it, you mentioned Tom, and Tom's a huge factor in this. And uh, Tom Moran, just to be clear in the video, <laughs> Tom yeah. Moran. Um, but the, uh, you know, the other thing though too is that you have, you know, there was a commitment, you know, mm -hmm. and there was the to go ahead and because we had a couple of moments there, like when we couldn't find the right fabricator that I thought I was gonna to have to do it in a completely different way. And I remember I came up with a whole other uh, design or environment. And, I, and Tom, you know, I heard back from Tom that you sort of said, now, let me get this straight. We're changing paths. <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, well, maybe not now. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's not appropriate. You know, so so I really enjoyed the process of uh, kind of going back and forth and working directly with you guys, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, grounds for sculpture. You you've taught you mentioned the history and all that stuff, but it, it's a real player in the the history of sculpture, certainly in New Jersey, definitely in the region, 
important people came through and worked at the atelier, worked on, you know, did exhibitions at Grands for Sculpture, did various things. And it's a little bit, you know, I'm always a little mystified that it's a little bit the unsung hero because mm -hmm. it's put forward important moments, uh, you know, certainly since it opened. Gary, what year did it open? Uh, to 92. 92, 92, yeah. So it's put forward important people, uh, you know, since 1992. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's, but that notion of commitment, man, you just don't get it every day of the week. And there was a little magic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, between all of us, you know, and mm -hmm. I think it's worth noting, everybody's an artist. Gary, you have a background as an artist. Tom mm -hmm. has a background as an artist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in other words, the sensibility about wanting to realize something ineffable, something yeah. difficult to get at, was like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, I think I, I take my role as the executive director a little bit like I'm a Trojan horse. Yeah. You know, like I, <laughs> I've like kind of moved my way into this leadership role and working with the board, but there's, uh, you know, yeah. sort of this, this activist artist at the heart that I'm trying <laughs> to change the institution. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so getting to work on projects like this is is, uh, is is exciting for us and it's exciting for our public, you know, to be able to come and this exhibition is, uh, you know, is up for a pretty lengthy period of time with COVID. It's, it's been extended even a little longer, but uh, that's another part of our commitment too, is that when we're investing in these projects in terms of the time and the relationship that, that develops, uh, where these aren't up for three months or six months, we keep them up for a year or more so yeah. that the public really can engage and programs can be developed and they kind of have a life of their own, so. Great. Um so this is a show hosted within a show, right? Mm -hmm. So with the inflatables, augmented reality, creating aggregate forms, uh, and this site and parasite. Let's talk a little bit about the AR and the digital work. And how does this work extend beyond the body, the host body, these, these organs or cells that you've created, and even the host body, which is the ground for sculpture. Can we talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, it, it, uh, there was one meeting where Gary and Tom and I met in New York City in my studio. And, you know, it wasn't a done deal that we were going to do something together. You know, we were, they, they, they were still thinking and I was still thinking and I didn't know what I would do or where, which way, you know, was I going to just present work I'd made and all that stuff. But, but, I, but it, on, in that day, Gary, I think you can verify for me and confirm me. I said, I really want to do three things. I want to do something that's never been done. I want to do something that includes these other people. And I want to print a catalog. <laughs> and, you know, from the very beginning, that was yeah, And we, by the way, we did all three, you know, as far as I could tell, we did all three. And um, so, uh, you know, but, but the, the parasite part, was the part that included the other artists. And it was something I knew I wanted to do from the very beginning. And that was an evolving process too, because uh, the, one of the artists that's in the Parasite part of the show was Will Pappenheimer. And Will and I had had a lot of conversations about just this very thing. How do we do a show? Uh, wouldn't it be interesting to do a sculpture show that had augmented reality, but then also have this parasitic relationship and parasite sounds bad because, you know, parasites are usually bad for human beings. But the truth is the word para just means alongside of and next to or within. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it comes from the Greek and it's quite important. And so parasite, and it was para parentheses site. So we had a site and a parasite. And um, the, uh, that was important on many levels, like for sure, it's hosted by Grounds for Sculpture. And so that's the first site, right? That's the first place. And then I literally have a parasitic relationship with Grounds for Sculpture. I've moved in for some period of time until you guys take your antibiotics. <laughs> <laughs> and then I invited a lot of other organisms to come in with me, right? And so, um, and so the biological level the fact that the pieces in and of themselves are cells, I mean, they're synthetic yeah. cells, or, but the, the fact that it makes reference to this biological level from the very start 
and then uses the, the language of parasite. And Will and I talked about a lot of those issues. Hmm. And uh, you know, I think we lost Gary. We lost oh, there we go. Yeah, we lost <laughs> you for just a, I guess your phone went, yeah, there we go. Um, but uh, we talked about it a lot. And actually we invited Will at one point to be the curator and he didn't think he could do it because of all his responsibilities and it would be a lot of work. And so he was the one that really introduced us to, to uh, I mean, we had various people. We, we had a big list of people that could do, potentially do it. But he was the one that introduced us to Ed Winkleman and Marat Orozbikov, both of whom were the curator of the Parasite exhibit. But, you know, Gary, it must have been quite challenging, too, as an institution to take on I mean, technologically, something like this is not it doesn't it has it doesn't happen regularly. This is a really unique uh, concept in exhibitions uh, mm -hmm. that, that you you just haven't seen. So you guys were we struggled a lot with the tech, you know, and how to figure out the tech. Yeah, it, but it, it, I think it's so integrated into the to the sculptures themselves, the physical sculptures, and yeah. I think it added an incredible um, amplification of that, um, you, you know, you talked about the, the cellular component, the biological and kind of multiplying of growth, you know, replication of cells. Um, but, you know, as I look at your background, even more so than mine, the, um, the kind of Windows environment on our computer screen of multiple tabs being open and one kind of dive into information of search leading to another, to another, that sometimes the, the logical connection of where you began and, and, and where you end in your Google, you know, deep dive um, is the kind of experience that you have here, both in your own augments and, and, the, and even the, the sort of uh, strange kind of unexpecting images that you've put onto these surfaces, yeah. the yeah. objects themselves, your augments. And then that gets amplified by then inviting in this kind of open source way, you've kind of in a, in a, again, shifting from the biological to the technological, the network, yeah. um, that you've created this platform that's an open source platform for the other artists to then create and add these layers on. And it, I, it, in so many ways, I think, you know, you talked, we talked a little bit about the subversion or the kind of destabilizing kind of quality of, of some of this work. But, but I think in some ways it's also incredibly generous in making um, tangible or physical um, the, what we experience now in, in this digital world that we live in, you know, that's, it's, um, I, and I don't know that I can actually put words on it, but it is very felt, uh, like the best of any artwork where it makes sense somewhere inside of you. Yeah. Like there's this sort of sense that this exhibition makes of the sort of chaotic, very scary sometimes, um, endless, you know, um, world of, of, of knowledge and, truth and untruths that, that exist out there. That's right. And I, I mean, I really appreciate you picking up on that. I, I, I just want to tag on two things. One is the notion of a portal and the mm -hmm. fact that those different augmented experiences yeah. take you to really distinct places like John Craig Freeman, for example. He's mm -hmm. got stuff from China, uh, you know, scanned environments from China. He's got stuff from the carnival. He's got some, you know, he had a lot. And Chris Manzione, who treated his work in a much more formal way. Or, uh, you know, uh, Tomiko Thiel, who, did, who decided to deal with uh, the oceans and the, the red, uh, I forget what it's called now, the red algae, you know, the poisonous development of mm -hmm. uh, the acidification of the seas and things like mm -hmm. that. These literally took you to other places and other spaces. And they did so within the structure of a computer, of that kind of computer logic that you're talking about. You have tab within tab within tab within tab, folder within folder within folder within folder. And you're having all these the multiplicity of experiences. I think the thing that I love about this is that it's not only a screen. It now is physicalized in the room. The cube world. also. That's right. You know, each plane yeah. of the cube being a different real, you know, potential reality yeah. portal to the others. Yeah, that's right. And different faces doing different things. And yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they're event structures, event structures. Uh, that's a great mm. And it's really generative. It's really a generative experience yeah. uh, with many levels. Uh, and the viewer's experience is, is one of them, right? They author, each viewer, each visitor 
will author their own kind of journey and pathway through mm -hmm. the cells. Um, you, know, you know, I, I have just a quick little story is that there was a mother with her two children. I mean, I'm assuming that they were her children, but they were experiencing one of the pieces. And I noticed that they had missed something, right? So I went over and, you know, like, I'm going to show you what you've missed. And I said, excuse me, but you realize, and they all three of them gave me the same look, which is, <laughs> excuse me, we're having an experience here. Don't bother me. Yep. And I thought, oh my God, I did my job. Yeah. You know, right. I totally <laughs> did my job. And I just slinked away, you know? <laughs> so, so um, I don't know how we're doing on time here, but. Well, we're doing pretty good. We're okay. Here's a question. Yeah, maybe five, 10 more minutes, something like that. So you, so you, um, you talk about utopias. Mm. Um, and so I'm just wondering what you mean by um, utopias. And you also talk about a collision of utopias. Right. Can you unpack that a little bit? Well, that was the, you know, once again, that was like very early thoughts about how to deal with this. I feel like in my own work, I have a companion show to this show. And that companion show was Clown Town, which was at Brav and Lee Projects in 2016, which uh, Gary, you saw that show, we met there, et cetera. Um, and the reason it's a companion show is that it really was the other side of it. This is the joy side of it and the kind of euphoria and the kind of, uh, you know, having connective tissue experiences and things like that. And, uh, you know, kind of bringing in biology and bringing in the life and life force, you know, the notion of a life force, a kind of Elan Vital or whatever have you. And the Clown Town was the, uh, on the eve of the 2016 election. That was when the show, it opened in October of 2016. And the show was very much about this moment where a clown, and I, you know, it was obvious sort of where the imagery came from in a way, where the clown could have just as much weight and just as much force as somebody who prepared their entire life to do something that that opinion of the clown, and that was a nature of digital media. So when I say that this show, uh, Synthetic Cells is the corollary, the corollary of the other side of the coin, maybe there's many sides to the coin, maybe it's a multiverse, a multivalent thing, but for sure, one of the other aspects was this political thing that I did with Clown Town. And with Clown Town, it was exactly the opposite desire. I wanted to make a really complex show that it didn't distill for anyone. And I wanted people to be able to enter it like it was a novel. And so that there was, a, each piece was a scene in the novel. So there was the, this is what the clown wears. This is where the clown lives. This is how the clown performs, you know, et cetera. But, you know, today we're not talking about clown time. But it was a, an examination of a sort of a darker side of this technology, the manipulative side of this technology. And it was, you know, we were kind of peeking underneath what was gonna, we didn't know that Trump would win it. In fact, when the show opened, I was pretty sure that all the Trump part of that show, which wasn't obvious, it wasn't up front and center, but it was, it was there. We kept wondering if that would be, uh, you know, I thought it was just be forgotten. You know, and then the show and the clown thing would just be what people remembered of it. Well, he became the president. <laughs> you know, the, the clown literally won. He became the president. And that was horrible. It destroyed my show. But it, but it also kind of showed me that my analysis of, uh, I hope I'm answering your question, but my analysis on the one hand of clown town and all that sort of stuff and what, how I was trying to capture that wasn't anywhere near as effective in a way as this show. And this show, the reason I say more effective is this show, you live here. You know, it touches you. It's like Gary said, the when you when you deal with bouncy houses or you deal with beach balls or whatever, it just triggers this set of uh, neurons in the in the mind that is about like, oh, I can relax, I can enjoy myself, I can expand the world, you know, and so a whole other thing becomes relevant. Um, but I, 
I, but I see them as being part and parcel of each other. I see them as being, so the dystopian utopian, maybe the dystopia was more clown town and the utopia is more uh, this. You can't have one without the other, you know? I mean, I always say, uh, you know, like about Marxism, for example, to my friends that are, you know, deep into that is that you really can't have Marxism without capitalism. Mm -hmm. So if you got rid of capitalism, what would that be? It has to be something else, something completely different. But yeah, Gary, you're going to say. Yeah, no, I just think it just to bring it back to the actual objects themselves and the, and the way in which they're constructed and, and the kind of conversation that they're having with, you know, formal modernism and, and, and the marriage of, of utopia, you know, in early 20th century abstraction and, um, you know, the, the hard edge, the, the pure geometry that, that the almost naive utopian kind of belief that that, that was possible, right? Yeah. And I think these, these complicate that. They're, they're machine made also, yeah. you know, but they've got air in them. So they've got this organ, this sense of life. You talked about the inherent uh, malleable kind of quality, like air pressure makes them change. Yeah. Right. They're also, you know, the, when they were flat and before they're inflated, they are pure geometric squares. Yeah. When you inflate them, they get these like kind of bulbous, drooping, they behave in slightly different ways. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you know, when you're talking about that, that the, the kind of tension between, uh, you know, capitalism and Marxism, like yeah. these, these are not one or the other, you know? And I, and I think they also as structural forms vacillate in that way and, and you know, kind of challenge um, that sense of, of is it, is utopia even possible or is utopia also points to one right like there's a sense of utopia and there's a multiplicity that's going on in in the potential failures and opportunities in, in this work right absolutely the idea of potential or potentialities in this exhibition this installation and each one of the pieces opens up a whole space of potentiality um, for the viewer uh, for a theoretical speculation about um, even virtual space or augmented reality, but a space, virtual space, uh, which doesn't necessarily exist anywhere, but it exists everywhere. It is kind of a real space. So this idea of utopia being no place, literally no place, actually it occupies this, this place really fully in a curious way. Um, and I think it's incredibly relevant in terms of how intensely connected now we are to a digital medium or outlet for our mm -hmm. psyche uh, yeah. uh, for, and for our pneuma, for, for our breath, for our bodies, for our consciousness. Uh, and um, Marshall McLuhan thought that actually the digital or the electronic was a direct neurological connection uh, to, uh, you know, to the technology, uh, but not only that, to an electromagnetic yeah. Uh, yeah. sort of flow in the universe at large. So just to really expand it, you know, for a moment, I think that these pieces uh, can, can really at once have this kind of formal, beautiful composition, like this expansive, the theoretical and, and physical, virtual, uh, and physiological space. Yeah. Well, you know, Anna, we, in our conversations leading up to this, you know, I talked a lot about the extended mind or, you know, some people may well know, it's funny that I have this book right here, uh, you know, Theater of the World by Francis Yates, which was the, you know, the notion of a memory theater that, you know, Shakespearean actors would plant uh, lines throughout the theater in a physical space to remember them because they had to remember 130 plays and they had to remember different parts of 130 plays and they did so through physical space. And that's such an interesting set of issues. And, and then Andy, uh, Andy Clark and uh, 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 I forget the guy's name, first name Chalmers, who also talked about the extended mind and developed all these theories of the extended mind. Well. What's interesting about the technology is that it actually does what we do already. It takes advantage and it reveals something about objects that I think it makes um, palpable, makes really um, 
it's it's not an illustration, but it's it's almost like a manifestation or a reification of the idea that there's other content stored within objects. It's done so in this case through the augmented reality, through different people taking uh, trips to China, as in John Craig Freeman, in, into comedy with Carla Gannis, into you know the swimming pool with uh, you know Will Pappenheimer, or the ocean with Tomiko Thiel, these kinds of incredible storages within these objects. You know, the crazy thing is the show will come down and we'll still have the software, but what you see right there in the background, what, what is behind Gary, will never exist again. Will never exist again, except in our own minds. And so, you know, these are fascinating, um, you know, just fascinating ways that uh, extend our mentality you know and i love you know i love thinking about those things you know thank you michael for for making that possible for for us and for our audience yeah well listen i, I you know a little earlier anna you asked well you know how about that commitment you know three years it's like i'm a sculptor just give me an opportunity i'll work on it for life <laughs> Well, and it really is. So, so, so Gary, thank you. Thank you for giving me the shot. You know, that's amazing. And, and Anna, thanks for participating in these conversations. It's really fantastic. A real pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for making this possible. Yeah.